I'm Bill Clark, and I'm an independent game developer in Seattle. I'm going to talk to you today about some game design principles that you can use when working on tower defense games. And specifically today, I'm going to be focusing on balance and math. So what is it that we're trying to accomplish when we talk about balance for a tower defense? For a design goal, I like to look at Raf Koster's definition of fun from a theory of fun for game design, in which he says that fun is the feedback the brain gives us when we are absorbing patterns for learning purposes. So specifically, I want to focus on learning as a goal for tower defense balance. To review, here are the player motivations that I've identified for tower defense players. Mastery and creativity, progression and power, complexity and puzzles, and elegance and aesthetics. And also, I'd like to review the core game loop that I identified in episode one, in which players start off by planning a defense, then identifying what the next step in building that defense is, observing until they can afford it, purchasing that step in the defense, and then going back and identifying the next step. And this is something that happens over and over again over the course of a single map. Now let's zoom out from the core game loop and identify what happens around the core game loop. When the player doesn't have a very strong understanding of the systems of the tower defense, they're going to need to choose a strategy, and typically they will rely on either their power motivation or their elegance and aesthetic motivation to give them some intuitive sense of what they want to use for their strategy. At that point, they're going to start playing the game and building a defense, seeing how it goes. Maybe their defense will be successful, at which point they're going to be able to go to the next stage and keep playing using roughly similar ideas. And this is where the mastery motivation is really satisfied because they can see, aha, I understood something and I demonstrated mastery over this part of the game. However, sometimes they're going to fail and not beat the map. That's going to require them to go back and rethink their strategy and adjust it and maybe choose a new strategy, and thus in particular engage with the complexity of the game. It's worth pointing out that learning requires both of these sides to be taken sometimes. Sometimes the player must succeed in order to have reinforced the things that are working, and sometimes the player has to fail in order to be shown that there are other strategies that they need to consider. So a goal statement for balance for a tower defense is that a balanced tower defense encourages learning through experimentation with challenges needing varied strategies. Learning through experimentation is how you can get at that fun that Raf Koster talks about. And in order to make it so that a, a player couldn't just stumble upon a single strategy and use that to beat the entire game, you need to present challenges that require varied strategies. So what does math have to do with any of this? There are a lot of levers that you can pull and adjust in order to try to balance a tower defense. And so I'm going to try to give you a sense of which levers can be pulled and how far to pull them when you're adjusting the balance. So now let's talk specifically about that subject that I keep coming back to, damage per second. Damage per second starts with the damage per hit times the number of attacks per second. And then obviously there's some other stuff, but let's zoom in on these two first. So now imagine that you have an infinite supply of monsters with a given amount of health, and then you want to attack them with towers that do fixed amounts of damage and find out how many hits it's going to take to kill them. On this chart, you can see in blue a tower that does 10 damage per hit, in red a tower that does 20 damage per hit, and in yellow a tower that does 30 damage per hit. And then you can see along the y-axis how many hits it takes to kill a monster with a given amount of health along the x-axis. This stair-step pattern is important to note, but let's think of a little bit more about what this means. We can instead think about the effective damage per hit, which is if you're killing a monster that has 27 health and it takes three hits, then your effective damage per hit is 27 divided by three, which would be nine damage. So this is a graph of that value, where again, you can see a tower that does 10 damage in blue, 20 damage in red, and 30 damage in yellow. This zigzag is very fascinating because it shows how much damage is actually being wasted. Because if the effective damage was the same as the actual damage, then that would be up at the peak of each of these uh, spikes. And so anytime that the curve is below the peak, that means that we're wasting some amount of damage. So the next graph I'm going to show you is what I would call the effective damage ratio. And that is if you divide the effective damage from the previous graph by the total damage that was expected, you will then get a multiplier for what percentage of the damage is actually being effective. So there's two things I would notice on this graph. First is that at very low monster health, you can be potentially wasting an enormous amount of the damage. 
And then second is right after you pass the monster health being very slightly higher than the tower damage, you can still get as low as 50% of the damage being wasted in that first trough. But as you can see, if we expand the graph out, it'll eventually trend towards being at roughly 100% effectiveness regardless of the precise fluctuation because it asymptotes towards that value. Thus, we can say a few things about increasing attack damage versus increasing attack speed as ways of increasing damage per second. First is that increasing damage per hit can waste virtually all of the damage if the damage per hit is substantially higher than the monster's maximum health. Even if the monster's maximum health exceeds the damage, you can still be wasting up to 50% if it doesn't exceed it by very much. Also, the lower the damage per hit, the less is wasted because the tower gets to switch targets shortly after killing off the previous target. Since increasing attack speed raises damage per second with the same damage per hit, it means that typically increasing attack speed is just straight up better than increasing damage. However, this is an interesting place where the mastery motivation and the power motivation are in conflict, because in general the power motivation is going to want to be doing bigger hits, even if attack speed is in general a better stat to increase. Critical hits are another way that towers can do increased damage. We can define them as saying that there is a C chance to do X times damage, in which case the damage per second is going to be multiplied by the mix of non-critical hits and critical hits. So it's going to be 1, which is a non-critical hit, times 1 minus the chance, plus X, which is the critical hit damage, times the chance. And we can rework that into 1 plus X minus 1 times C and that's gonna be the multiplier to damage per second from critical hit chance. Thus we can see it scales roughly linearly with the damage multiplier as well as with the chance to crit. However, as with damage per hit, wasted damage is specifically a concern, and it's actually a bigger concern than with damage per hit because it, like crit hits are going to be doing just bigger numbers, and therefore you're going to be getting closer and closer to those high values that can potentially waste a lot of damage. However, again, the power motivation can engage very strongly with critical hits as a very satisfying way to feel the power of your towers. Now let's talk about tower range and AoE radius and how they affect damage per second. So again, we have damage per hit times attacks per second is going to be part of damage per second. But then I've talked about uptime, which is the percentage of the time that a tower is shooting. How does that relate to attack range? I've also talked about the number of targets per hit. How does that relate to the AOE radius? In both of those cases, we can do very similar math to arrive at the number of available targets that a given radius is going to give us. So here you can see a red line that represents the path that a monster is going to take. And the amount of overlap with the circle is what amount of time it's going to take the monster to move through the circle, and thus the amount of time that that monster is going to be available for this circle. So we're interested in this overlap value here. The tunable value for the circle is going to be the radius here. And then for a given tower or AOE splash location, there's going to be a distance between the center of the circle to the path. You can note here that this is going to give us a right angle, which allows us to use Pythagorean theorem for the right triangle. And thus we have a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where c squared is the hypotenuse. If we call half of the overlap here x, then that can be the a d for the distance is going to be the b, and r for the radius is going to be the c, the hypotenuse. So therefore we get x squared plus d squared equals r squared, or x, half of the overlap, is the square root of r squared minus d squared. Therefore the overlap is roughly linear with the radius of the circle, provided the radius does overlap with the path. When I say roughly linear, what I mean by that is down at very low radius, there's going to be a little bit of a non-linearity, but as you increase the radius, it's going to approach linear pretty rapidly. There is, however, one unique wrinkle, which is when increasing the radius is going to give you access to separate sections of path. And so we can say that x is roughly linear with the radius if the radius is greater than the distance to the path, but there is a breakpoint when we get new targets when the radius crosses the distance to another path. So now we've seen how radius affects available targets, but what does that mean for uptime? Is uptime linear with attack radius? Well, uptime only requires a single target to be available in order for the tower to keep shooting, 
And so attack radius does absolutely nothing except when it causes us to go from having zero available targets to having one available target. It is linear in those spaces when going from zero to one target. However, it's completely flat for any time that there are more than one target available. Therefore, in general, attack radius scales way less than linearly because most of the time a tower is going to have multiple targets that it can choose between. Now let's talk about area of effect radius. Are the targets per hit linear with the area of effect radius? Well, if there are many evenly spaced targets, then yes. However, sometimes, like on a boss round, there will be fewer monsters, and thus AoE radius may be lower than linear. So now let's take some of these different sources of damage per second and put them on a continuum of how effective they are at increasing damage per second. Attack speed is guaranteed to be linear up until all of the targets are dead, and thus it is the perfect example of a stat that can go up without any loss to effectiveness. Pretty close behind it is AoE radius, which, until you run out of targets to include in the circle, is going to scale up the number of targets that are being hit. Damage per hit is also very good and close to linear, but you have to worry about wasted damage, and thus it is not quite as good as attack speed for increasing DPS. And critical hits are a little bit worse than damage per hit because, again, you're increasing even further the amount of damage that will be dealt, thus increasing the risk of wasted damage. And then way down at the bottom is attack range, which has a very poor response towards increasing damage per second. That isn't to say you can't increase damage per second by increasing attack range, but you would need a much higher proportional increase in order to have it be effective. The next subject I want to touch on is armor, and two of the main ways that armor can be conceived of in tower defense games. One type of armor implementation is percent damage reduction. In this case, a monster is going to have effective hit points that is going to be the maximum number of hit points divided by 1 minus the percent damage reduction, because that's how much damage it's actually going to take in order to kill the monster. It's important to note that the source of the effective hit point doesn't affect the damage per second sources from the previous section, and thus armor piercing or breaking is required in order to make percent damage reduction actually meaningful for the balance of a tower defense. When we're trying to define percent damage reduction in terms of some quantity that we call armor, there are various formulas that you can use. For example, you could have the percent damage reduction be 1 minus the armor value, in which case the armor value can go from 0 to 1. Another formula that I like is from League of Legends, and that is 100 plus armor divided by 100. And this has the nice heuristic of every time you gain 100 armor, you gain your maximum HP in effective HP. The other major way to think about armor is to have it be a flat damage reduction. That is to say, every time the monster is hit, it takes N less damage. This has a strong effect on the scaling of damage per hit for damage per second calculations. When damage per hit is below the damage reduction, then increasing damage per hit doesn't accomplish anything. You're still not going to do any damage. However, when damage per hit exceeds the damage reduction, you get this interesting nonlinear behavior where a, say, 5% increase in damage per hit is going to yield a greater than 5% increase in damage. This graph is going to represent how much higher of a percent increase in effective damage after damage reduction you get than the percent increase in damage per hit that was applied. And so if we specifically think about going from 20 damage to 21 damage, it's very illustrative. Because that is a 5% increase in damage per hit, and if there's no damage reduction, then that's what we get, 5% damage per hit. However, if there's a 10 damage reduction, we will go from doing 10 to 11 damage, which is a 10% increase and thus that's twice as effective as we expected. And if there was 20 damage reduction, then we would go from doing zero damage to doing one damage, which is not a value that this graph can represent. However, it is obviously a lot bigger of a percentage increase than the 5% that we would have expected. And thus flat damage reduction is going to cause increases in damage per hit to be more effective than they would be expected to be. Regardless of what type of armor you have implemented in your game, you may want to have some armor reduction either through piercing or breaking of the armor. If you do a flat reduction of the armor value, then that's going to be better on low amounts of armor, versus if you have a percentage reduction, then that's going to be better on high amounts of armor. Regardless of how you approach it, there's going to be a lot of complexity for people who are motivated by that to engage with in order to try to min-max how their towers interact with armor. Between this talk and the previous episodes, we now have a lot of tools that we can use to think about an example of a balanced decision.
A player may be presented with a circumstance where they can either build more towers or invest in making the towers that they have better. If the player builds more towers, then they're going to have a lower average damage per hit for each of those towers than if they were better towers. And therefore, that's going to allow them to avoid wasted damage from overkill. It's going to allow them to target many areas across the map, which is going to help with targeting low availability monsters like flying monsters or stealth monsters because more of the map is covered. They may be able to combo those towers together and have more opportunities for comboing because there are more towers on the map. And thus they can be applying their combos in many different locations. And if the game allows mazing, then those cheaper towers can be used to build the maze, thus yielding a more complicated maze than if they did not have as many towers. If, on the other hand, the player decides to invest in better, more powerful towers, then they're going to increase their damage per hit, which can be better against damage reduction. They will have fewer towers placed, which means that they're going to be able to focus on the best tower placements on the map. Again, they're going to be able to combo their towers together, but potentially higher level combos are going to be more effective than lower level combos. And the towers can be placed at very important crucial points within the maze, thus making even better use of those placements. And so as you can see, there are different reasons why each of these would be good choices for players to make. And you as a designer can try to make it so that sometimes one of these is better and sometimes the other. That way, players are never going to be able to settle in on one strategy that always works and will be presented with different problems that force them to learn about when different strategies are appropriate. So now let's go over what we've talked about today. First off, I described the player journey and how it is important for players to both succeed in order to reinforce when what they're doing is working, but also to fail in order to be forced to reconsider and come up with new strategies. Then I walked through the math of some damage per second sources and pointed out places where some of them, aside from attack speed, will be less than linear and thus less powerful to increase than attack speed would. Then I talked about tower range and AOE radius and how both of those affect damage per second. I was honestly surprised that the response was linear in terms of the number of available targets from the increases in radius. Then I talked about a couple of different ways of implementing armor and the importance of having some form of armor reduction in order to add complexity to your game. Finally, I gave a test case of when a player might be deciding between placing more towers versus placing better towers, and how they may weigh that decision in order to come up with the best strategy. Finally, here is my challenge to you, based upon some writings from Tyne and Sylvester in the Designing Games book. Elegance happens when mechanics interact in complex, non-obvious ways but the same complexity and non-obviousness makes elegant design very difficult to achieve. A lot of the building blocks of the tower defense genre have complexity and interact in non-obvious ways that yields elegance. But in order to make your tower defense good, you're going to be having to add your own mechanics, your own tower types, your own monster types, your own other ways for the player to interact with the game. And I would encourage you to look for elegance. Try and make sure that your new mechanics also interact in complex and non-obvious ways with the existing mechanics of the genre. Thanks for watching. I'm really enjoying making these videos. Down in the description, you're going to see a link to my Discord where you can come to talk to me and other interested people about tower defenses and other game development topics. A link to my blog where I write about game development. A link to a Reddit thread where you can come and discuss this video and a link to other videos. I'd love to hear your thoughts and questions about this video, as well as what you'd like to hear me discuss in future videos. I'm really enjoying making these, and it's really great to find the community that is passionate about these games, just like I am. Thanks. Bye.